As Steve Richards has said, by his libido shall ye know him. What then can the movies, TV shows and video games, as libidinal interests, tell us about our psychodynamics? Being able to utilise a patient's fantasy life to access the unconscious is an apex level clinical skill, and it's something that Steve and Pauline Richards have recently been training some of our IPSA students to be able to do. Such a thing is also useful for self-development. What interests has one's libido flown to, and at what times, over the course of one's own personal myth thus far? In this clip, taken from a recent IPSA professional training seminar, Steve receives several questions on this topic. We hope you enjoy. With this, you utilized the young guy's fantasy life, basically, mm -hmm. because of the stuff he was he was interested in. Yeah. I'm wondering how applicable in this sense it could be to adults, insofar as how relevant is libidinal interest in that regard to the overall assessment? Would it be something you'd actively search for, or would you wait till someone brought it up, per se? Uh, personally, I would always want to know where it is and what it's up to. So would you always ask a question in an initial session or something? You know, what's your favourite movies, video games? No, I wouldn't necessarily ask it, but that's on the table as an option it, because it, it, the relationship unfolds, it's interactive. You may get sufficient indication. Yeah. If there's nothing there, I might. I might ask that. And um, sometimes having a sand tray set up is in, in the same room is good because there's all sorts of things on there. You know, we used to have Doctor Who's TARDIS on the shelf, for example, and people would be like that, that's it. And there'll be a figure of Doctor Who and the master, you know, his polar opposite, his Jungian shadow, that kind of thing would be there. And someone would say, well, is that for kids? And I, I must say, yeah, I, I used to watch it when I was a child. You know, and um, did you kind of thing? And who was your favourite doctor? Paul has used this, in, haven't you, in chronic burnt out psycho. I say burnt out with honestly all humanistic respect for these people who are suffering. But there's that one person in particular who, who you built up rapport through oh, yes. uh, Doctor Who with. Oh, yes, yeah. yes, I mean, yes. He, he I, approached you, didn't he, as you were going into the, uh, into the hospital? I, I think, I, I don't know whether it might have even been my first day, so it was uh, <laughs> a bit disarming, to say the least. I kind of went through the hospital gates and uh, this gentleman uh, approached me and uh, basically said to me, I'm Doctor Who, who are you? And I thought, blimey, you know, I'm, I'm being tested already and, and how I answer him is going to be so important. Yeah. And um, I think fortunately, because I wasn't too phased by it, and obviously you'd been into Doctor Who for, for donkey's years, Steve, hadn't you really? Yeah, but, the original, and so I was the original familiar, yeah. 1963. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I was uh, familiar enough yeah. with it as a television series and the, yeah. and the different doctors and and what the significance of that might be for him that I was at least able to engage with him um, in a way that established rapport and um, well we did a lot of therapeutic work, work together as it happens after that but I think that initial meeting set the foundation really for the the relationship that then developed on from that and uh, yeah, but you, you get tested all the time and sometimes when you least expect it and, and, and yeah. how you respond to that can be, um, yeah. it, well, it can yeah. be so important, can't it, it can. For the, in, in terms of how the, the rest of the therapy and the relationship progresses. So but he's a, a chronic, chronic psychotic, yes, wasn't he, was. he? And he, he yes. had to be hospitalised. Yes. Uh, so yes. how far you could go with that was limited. It was, uh, but it yeah. was important for rapport because that guy trusted Pauline immediately, whereas if she, thereafter, yeah. for your duration of yes, for the three years you were there, weren't you? That yes. unit, yeah. Yes. Um, if that had not happened, that was it. That was the test. It was, yeah. So yeah, you have to be careful with psychotic people. You do. Uh, how far you go using imagination, but yes. someone who's just ordinarily neurotic, should we say? 
They're suffering from common un unhappiness, or no, you want them to be commonly unhappy, not neurotic misery. Then you, you have to go uh, for where the imagination is, because usually the solution mm. to their problem is, is locked in that somewhere symbolically. Yeah. 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 That's super useful. Thank you, guys. Yeah. So uh, is, is there anything further on that, James? Because that's, that's, that's an interesting yes. point yes. that we could develop on yeah. from that. Yeah. I'm, I'm just trying to balance the, the questions versus the nuance of the case, if you know what I mean, because to abstract yeah. out too much, it might, might miss something. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking about the, the importance then of, of these interests. I, f I find it funny though, Pauline, um, uh, I'm, I'm Doctor Who, who are you? Although technically the character is not called Doctor Who, is he? He's the, the Doctor. Yes, that, that, well, yes, that's true. So strange. Well, that originally, his name was Grandfather. Oh, yeah. He took on the, the persona of, of a doctor for his granddaughter when she was visiting a school when they had a holiday. In London mm. in 1963, mm. and then the first companion called him Doctor Foreman because the, the the TARDIS was in a junkyard, Foreman's junkyard, and the girl, the granddaughter, used the name Foreman as a surname, and he said to him, Doctor Foreman, mm. he said, "Hey, Doctor, Doctor Who? Who's he talking about?" And that was it. That was the introduction. Mm. I've got you. I've I've not seen that far back. I started with the the new Christopher Eccleston stuff that came up like. Oh. Feel sorry for you. So do I. So do I. Um, <laughs> never mind. Never mind. Yeah. Well. So. So everyone has interests, basically. So I'm. I'm just. Yeah. Uh, there's. There's a question buzzing. I'm not quite sure what it is, but everyone has interests. But a lot of those interests are shared in the culture a lot. I'm thinking today of Netflix and stuff like that. Is it Squid Game? The most yeah, recent Game, yeah. like obsession culturally, and it was viewed like a hundred million times yeah, across the world. Years. Marvel stuff, stuff like that. And it's like, I guess, how relevant could those things be to an individual insofar as they're shared with everybody else? And I don't, I don't know what the question is, but there's something there that's bugging me, if you like. Well, well that's okay. I, I can help you with that because obviously we meet this, you know, and in the information age that my generation might think of it as being, because we remember before that, it appears to be different, but that's only on the surface because even with a a collective influence like the way the Marvel Universe has been you know, plastered all over uh, uh, at the moment, what attaches to that fundamentally will root in the soil of the individual. So what you would do is use that as a, as a doorway to get through. Uh, as in the uh, dialectical imagery protocol, the case study with that, where the, the man was into, a, an Irish guy was into that particular uh, television series called Bally Kiss Angel, where there was a pub, that was it, that was the anchoring point. When he went through the doors and saw the barmaid that he, that he liked in the series, that was it. At that point, it changed into something else. So it's only the initial hook. So you can think of it as being the bait from the unconscious that's on the surface that draws the attention of the individual and then invites someone like us to come along and catch hold of the bait but not be pulled under, not even to pull it out, but to meet it somewhere with, where it's convenient in order to find out where it will go. I'm with you. I'm with you. That, that, the reason that, that is the case is because in all cases, these things are containers for something which is not the container. The container is the, 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 the medium of expression that the imagination uses, but that's not the thing in and of itself. And that's why uh, people who are obsessive fans into sci-fi or wherever it might be, never solve whatever it is they are projecting into it whilst they are attached to the image as the image. And that's really fundamental Young 101 about that, not being beguiled by the image. Mm. The image is on the surface. It means something else. It's a convenience. It's as if the unconscious projects into, which it does, into the culture, and then it, it comes back as a resultant image, which has that which is really trying to get through concealed behind it. That way, it accommodates difference across everybody who's projecting into it. Insofar as we're dealing with complexes, insofar as we're dealing with lifespan development and instincts, they do start to become common again, which is why Jungians talk about them being archetypes which I think is just another layer of distraction. Instincts are about action. So 
when we access instincts, you start to see Freud beginning to turn into a healthy version of Adler, which takes us back to where we were before. Rather than the image being mistaken as being something special, and therefore you get a Jungian style inflation and distraction, which means that Freud and Adler just ramp up because they've been misunderstood. So we, it, is a sim, it is a symptom, we take it as a symptom, but not pathological. It's a symptom that is a signal which is misunderstood. That's why it's important not to suppress it or to, to you know, spirit it away, pardon the pun, with some kind of hyper-rationalism, but to engage with it and see what's beneath it or to one side of it. And then descend down through the personal layer, which is purely individual, and then see what instincts are coming through. So um, obsessive fans, I mean, really obsessive ones, or people who are into anime or whatever it might be, and the libido's pouring into that, you will, you, you must, we all do, I know we do here, we all do this, appreciate that that is a container for transduced instincts to take on that shape and form. And insofar as the person relates only to the image, they are still contained. So they are contained and trapped themselves by the thing that is trying to tell them what the problem is, but they ignore that and only look at the image and are trapped. That's, that's perfect. That cleans it up so well. Thank you. Especially when you mentioned the resultant image aspect, that's what made it click. So, so uh, a little bit like any kind of projection, the, this media piece was going squid game or something. Mm -hmm. That's a suitable hook for something, an instinct that's therefore shared across millions of people. Hence why lots of people will be drawn to it. And the, but the image in and of itself will become resultant because it's be individual to each individual person. Yes. So, it, so yeah, that's, that's the slight frame shift I needed. Thank you. And then it's reinforced, of course, because there's a group effect that they, they all know millions of people are into Squid Game. So therefore, it, it says this is the right thing to do because others are doing it. And the others are doing it gives you a clue too because it means it is collective it's about the group it's about adaptation so if i want to relate my instincts are telling me to relate i need to be like other people and i need to interpret my instincts the way that they're interpreting them that's a fundamental adaptive dynamic but when it's then put into a containing vessel it stops adapting and it just contains them but they have the reinforcement of the group identity which is part of the problem and and uh, very often when people see you're right yes sorry. Yeah. but when, when uh, very often when people see through the projections they lose their energy and they can have a bereavement <clears throat> a sense of bereavement and loss that i no longer want to watch that particular television program or that movie or that video game it doesn't mean anything for me anymore but then they think oh well, i'm not meant to i'm meant to live yeah so you get into that cross-modal zone where there's bereavement at loss and there is an analogue projection in a relationship. When somebody withdraws the projection, they feel bereaved, depressed, loss of soul, loss of animation. And then the rebound back into the reality principle says you must adapt and it's OK. You had fun for a while, but now you need to live. And then you get the, the flow back from the instincts which make a person feel relaxed and better and motivated because the container is no longer needed. Well, we were listening to a piece of music last night, Steve, weren't we? we were, yeah. um, which had a, a popular video game playing in the background, very yeah. sort of powerful, rousing piece of music. And uh, you said to me, well, yes, I can I can see why that would be popular with a, with a lot of young men and why they would listen to that and they feel the energy of it. But whilst they're contained in the fantasy, mm. they're not going to do anything with it. No. And, and that's that's the sad what thing, isn't it? Oh, um, Miracle of Sound, Valhalla. The, the Valhalla oh, one. Valhalla, yeah. 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 The, uh, yeah. Uh, we've seen this uh, yeah. so often, and there's, there are so many young men who uh, have been told they can't be men, and uh, therefore it's going off into fantasy. Yeah. And the, this Viking image, which is not a real one, it, it, it's a cultural and a manipulated one by the movie industry and the games industry, you know, you, you see your, your Vikings with their 21st century Hercules. And uh, we remember Kirk Douglas in the 1958 movie. Yes, I do. Vi well, I do as well, <laughs> Vikings. 
didn't have hair like that. Neither did the other Vikings. Well, what are the real Vikings? The real Vikings were what they were. But the culture tends to interpret them in a particular way, and it tends to reflect the people of the day. <clears throat> so there they were looking like that. So the young lads of today can identify with these uh, hyper masculine caricatures. Mm. So it's a containing vessel. Yeah. And for commercial reasons, it's that way to entrap the young men to indulge in it. That's absolutely fine. And the music's great and fine. Try doing that, though. You know, you'll be cancelled. All the, all the wokeism. That's what effect, you're threatened with, isn't that, it? That's what yeah. you're threatened with. So the way out will be to find an alternative way of expressing all of that that's organised in a way that's deliverable and doesn't provide a fantasy distraction. Mm. But if it was with a patient, you'd have to find the way to get there, yeah. to detach them from the fantasy and into the actuality of life. And this is why we have to start with ego strength because you build the ground beneath your feet for the ego and it can stand on it and say, I am, I exist. I am me. I have my past. I have my ancestral past and my direction is forwards. It is not into suppression, repression, self neutering. It's not into Nietzsche's abyss via a celebrity guru or anything like that. I, I will actualize my genome. People then find that they want to act in the world. Um, so it's one grain of sand with each individual on the scales. But yeah, it, it seemed to be really clear that that's what was going on, how the uh, the imagery was being manipulated. Yeah. That's brilliant. I mean, our, our, our projects, for example, you know that we're involved in, in films and, and we had people on this morning about that. And last night from within the film industry, there's interest growing again. The difference about, uh, with ours is that yeah, it's mythic fiction, mm. which is a specific genre, which is unfamiliar to the film industry. You get it in novels, uh, but we're, we're very much in, in that. And it's Jungian in spirit, in the sense that it's looking for people to complete themselves properly. Uh, how the hell do you do that? Well, you'd seldom do it on your own. And the best Greek myths understood that. They were shared journeys. There's very rarely an actual abstracted individual character in a Greek myth. Even in the ones where we talk about people like Theseus or Perseus, they're never on their own. Jason had his Argonauts, that's the clearest one. And they were all heroes too. They went on a shared journey. Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey are shared journeys and people evolve in lockstep together through relating. So our stories are like that. There are characters and in effect, the entire film is one human personality. And I don't mean these are sub-personalities at all. What they do is reflect instinctive reactions to patterns which are universal. That's not an archetype. I don't define them as archetypes at all. It's a through line of living. It's not a static figure, which we abstract out like Gandalf and say he's a magician. That doesn't mean anything. Gandalf has no, out of his context, he's flat. He's nothing. You have to have the complete context. So therefore you have to have Ardla to go back to that. The, the drive is essentially Freudian. The goal is Jungian but you have to get through the Adlerian level and it's a shared journey amongst the whole context that people interact with. So in, in that sense, that's the same for individuals when they learn to adapt to the world and to themselves. They have to come to terms with their instincts and with social adaptation before they can get to anything like an authentic Jungian adaptation to the world. Uh, and that's what our stories do. They, they, they work fundamentally on that. And to do that, you have to go to instinct. You, you have to have situations that are not archetypal. They're collective, but they're not archetypal in that distracting sense. They're instinctive because an instinct is an anticipation of an entire scenario that unfolds over time towards a goal. That's an instinct, even if it's hunger, which is a drive by another definition, but you anticipate eating. You even have impressions forming in your mind of the food that you want because your metabolism knows and produces an image that you can understand psychologically and then plan and act in the world how you will meet that need. This is Mark Solms. He, he talks like that and Pangsep, but it's the same with what Jungians call archetypes. They go on about archetypes, but they're all characters in a myth which is a massive context which unfolds over time. That's what they're missing. They get beguiled by the projection into the characters. Mm. And that's why none of them are truly creative. That's why they'll never be film writers. 
No one would ever listen to them because the stories they'd come up with would be utter crap. And I'm saying that with my other hat on, you know, the story would be utter crap if a Jungian, Orthodox Jungian tried to write any of this stuff. It would be full of cliches and stereotypes. Like Star Wars. Yeah, I mean, Star Wars <laughs> was, was successful yeah. um, in a manipulative sense. And a lot of people clue into it. Uh, and I know probably quite, I know some people here are into that. But that is um, that was successful because it mirrored the past and it was a collective story, even though there were highlighted individuals, it was a shared journey. Um, and you can say, oh yeah, they're, they're archetypal. No, it's an instinctive push right the way through. Every character in Star Wars acts according to instinct. Fundamentally to meet something that's emerging from within themselves. Even the ones who are called archetypes are operating according to an instinctive drive that makes sense. If it didn't make sense, we could not relate to them. So the archetype is the, uh, the, the projection of the instinct into a narrative. Um, it's Jung said the self-portrait of an instinct. It's more than that. And it's also less than that. They're the modification of instincts as we understand them because instincts evolve too. People say, how can that happen? Well, your brain's evolved. The fact that your brain evolves, that means the whole regulatory system that you have also evolves in lockstep to it. Those animals that don't have an evolved cerebral cortex behave differently. Those that don't have a limbic system, don't have an emotional brain, still breed. They're still impelled to reproduce, but they lack care. Like the turtles, Pauline mm. was mentioning the other day on, I think, on the yeah, card one. Yeah, the sea turtles. The mother lays the eggs, covers them up, and as soon as they hatch, she's off because there's no limbic system. So those animals who have a limbic system have to have an evolved set of instincts. When we get to the higher cortical levels as well, we have evolved instincts. We can understand things in a way that's different. We can generate imagery of the future spontaneously by an act of will, so it appears. But it's the working of all levels of the brain simultaneously engaging so you think of the biopsychosocial stack, there's a, a resonant pattern, which is dynamic and changing. You take a snapshot of that at any one moment, you have the expression of the whole organism operating. So if you try and put an archetype in that, you'll find the archetypes don't play. It's a dog that doesn't hunt because it doesn't exist about its context. That's an archetype as Jung understood it. With respect to an instinct though, the instincts at every level simultaneously driving, pulling and pushing, and expressing behavior towards goals all the time. So I would argue that archetypes as they are misunderstood are instincts that have evolved into a level that human beings can relate to and share culturally. Um, that's my view, nobody has to accept it. But I find that very, very useful when I'm working with people to understand that. And uh, whether we're working with imagery uh, that's spontaneous which actually is a different thing. And it, I discussed this with James, I think, the other day uh, privately uh, that, uh, or whether it's something that's a resultant image that's produced by the interaction of pressure from within and pressure from without. The ego sits in the middle and then it has something occur to it that it can understand and feel attached to in the context of instincts. If that makes sense, James, in some it does. sense. It does, it does. It clears up a lot. Well, so that definitely answers my initial question. I didn't even know how to formulate, but also it gives me a lot to work with. So my head's buzzing at the moment with lots of different things. While I, while I have a think on stuff, is it all right if Nick jumps in? Yeah, sure. Hi, Nick. Hey, everybody. Um, no, Steve, I mean, what you said resonated a lot because being a member, or previously being a member of, of what you might consider a fanboy community, myself it is it, it's 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 very contaminating in a way because there is this ducked off of whatever potential instinctual potential into these these cultural stories um and then being in that community it just compounds that even more so um and i even found for myself now as an adult male i still have friends who are older than me that are still very much just giving everything into these, you know, waiting in line for hours to see a film. Um, I, I had one friend recently, he actually would 
continually compare my experience or take what he thought my experience was and, and graft a certain character onto it and say, hey, look, look at like you did this, like this fictional character. And it was very unhealthy for me. And finally, I had to say to him, like, listen, for, for our friendship, but not only that, for my own mental health, like I, you, you cannot do this. Like it, it, it needs to stop altogether. Um, and it's, I, I find myself now talking to men and women that, that are a part of it. You're not only having a conversation about and, 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 or, or a therapeutic conversation about them getting in tune with their instincts and what that means and living their own life. But you're also having a conversation about how that interaction with themselves will directly correlate to certain extra interactions they'll have with the community that they're in. Um, and it's almost like, wow, my social situation could potentially change drastically if I start realizing the potential within myself. That being said, I think once that starts happening, you, 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 you end up developing, becoming an example for others to say, I don't have to just go home every day and rely on the idea of, well, at least I have this film, or at least I have this comic book, or at least I have this book, whatever it is. Um, I think that's, that's massively important. Everything you just said is massively important for a lot of people now to hear. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. I mean, I've been victim to it as well. I've lived long enough uh, to, 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 to go through that phase of Jungian based misinformed, identification with movies and with characters and uh, when I track that back over my own timeline every single one of them was a pothole in the road for me that, that, that caused me to be wobbled and, and, and taken off course and, and to not engage with life no I know the value I, I really do know the value of myth it is healing Jung was absolutely right um but we we should deliver a story which uh, gives people the feeling that they are acting in the world. They are not the characters, but they are inspired by them. That's difference, isn't it? Yeah, it's a huge difference. And then Pauline, you mentioned you mentioned music. I actually did this. I, I did this for myself um, three days ago. I went through all the playlists that I had listened to the last four years, and I I just found this through line of this this music that would just get me hyped up, but it was literally going nowhere. Yeah. And, uh, and like evaluating that and saying, okay, it's not just visually what I'm looking at and the fantasy material that I'm consuming through the, a screen or through a book or a comic book. It's what I'm putting in my ears, mm. um, which is something that uh, it's, I don't think it's something that's been identified on on a mass scale at this point, because there is a huge market of what you might call epic music yeah. that is now surging throughout the culture. Um, and it's like, well, I, I wonder why. And now, now I'm, I'm finally understanding like, no, no, this is just a divergence of instinct into these kind of big bombastic musical pieces. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, I think you're absolutely right, Nick. And uh, if we can help people to understand what the underlying dynamics are, what, what it instincts are at play, uh, what instincts are stimulated when, when people listen or, or, you know, watch these kinds of videos, then we're actually, we're moving them away from just purely from the fantasy um, of them, which keeps them trapped, of course. And, and as you know, this is why uh, Jungians keep people trapped for, for years, for decades in analysis, because they, you know, the thing that they're trapped in themselves, which is, is the fantasy, whether it's um, whatever form that takes, yeah. um, the, that's their area of unconsciousness. Uh, and we know wherever we're trapped as therapists unconsciously, we will trap others. Mm. And um, you know, it's it's a terrible thing because people are, are, are literally losing chunks of their life yeah. over to this kind of nonsense. And if only they can be helped to understand what's really going on. And it's, you know, the, really speaking, those answers have, have, have been there all along. So as long as people have understood about the existence of instincts, yeah. it's just that it's like, well, why isn't this? properly understood well of course if it was to some extent that would mean that therapy was over very quickly and there probably wouldn't be some of the financial incentives that are involved in keeping people trapped for, for years as well um but 
it, it, it takes it takes a, a shift, doesn't it, away from a particular discipline and into other disciplines, such as the neuropsychoanalysis, for example, uh, and neuroscience more broadly, to see that there's other ways of looking at these things, and they're far more helpful. And they move people on so much more quickly. And then, of course, you can still go back and enjoy the music mm -hmm. and, and, and enjoy the, you know, the videos, uh, video games or, or whatever, but without being completely absorbed by them mm -hmm. and contained by them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess that's why we we promote the idea of instincts as, as heavily as we do, because we know the value of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. We, we saw a historian yesterday, actually. We did, um, yes. The guy's also an archaeologist yeah, and he, he yeah. works for the BBC and yeah. that's why he was talking to us. And yeah. we did know him. Uh, haven't seen him for a few years, but we were talking about things in the culture because he didn't really know what we did you know, in this field. No. He only knows us from the other uh, side of the equation. He was fascinated. And, and, and then he said about the culture, he said, well, of course, if you know history, you know exactly what's happening now. Uh, and I said, yeah, if you know history, you know how human instinct plays out. Mm. And he understood that. He got that straight away. There was no need to create archetypes. No. He was a historian. He knew the story. Yeah. He was an archaeologist. He knew it. Uh, instinct was a sufficient model for him to feel why he understood today in reference to the past and could see the future. So archetypes are fantasies, really, as they're pushed around. Yeah. What they're said to be is real. It's just that they're misunderstood in my view. They are instincts. Mm. They're the expression of instincts, but they are instincts. They're not separate. I think Jung was completely wrong on that in my view. Yeah. Well, and you bring up history and I think that's, that's, it's not, I look at, I look at previous generation generations, not having the kind of hyper stimulus that is the fantasy content that we have now. And I think they were more geared towards reading and consuming material of actual people and yeah. actual people, people that actually lived and experienced. So, so reading, reading a biography of, of Theodore Roosevelt, instead of waiting in line for three hours to see a Marvel movie, yeah. you, you, you had history there in an of a story of instinctual pattern throughout a lifespan. Yes. Um, yeah. That's yeah, what that's makes a biography. Sorry, Nick. Mm. No, no, go. For me, that's what makes a biography interesting, mm. is to see how the lifespan yeah. unfolds. So mm. I think if, if you go in there looking for archetypes, that, that's that's quite childish. I mean, where are we? Are we in Alice Through the Looking Glass, Alice in Wonderland? Or, or are we looking at the real adaptation of a life as they grow from child and then the sun sets? You know, the, the arc of life is instinctive. Mm. And what we call archetypes are modifications through living in culture of yeah. instincts, in my view. And I found that so helpful clinically. And it's also helped me to get over myself to the extent that I was being slowed down by fantasy when I was younger. Yeah. And I was heavily into it um, because it seemed rational to me to escape the, uh, the mismatch I had in my life between what I wanted to be and what I was being forced to do. Uh, and so it provided the ideal escapism and it elevates too. And of course, by being elevated, when your feet aren't on the ground, it's not good. You get blown around everywhere. Uh, and it was really working with other people that cured that for me. Hi, Foster. Hey, Steve. So I was wondering, going back to the conversation you were having with Nick about um, containment. So with media, so it seems kind of like there's a parallel there between therapy containing people. And we've yeah. talked about that a lot before. And we've kind of teased out how that happens and why, so that you don't, we don't do that ourselves. And I was wondering if you could do a similar thing with media. Like how could you write a creative work or create a creative work regardless of the medium, or maybe you have to limit it to a medium that doesn't contain people. It's like the only thing that I can think of straight off the bat to be like with movies or books or whatever to not write in the sequels because like that happens with like we were doing Marvel as an example. Marvel just keeps making a bunch of sequels. So then like the through line never really ends. But beyond that, I couldn't really think of anything that would stop the containment. I was wondering if you could talk about that. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, when we, um, thanks Foster, just thinking, putting my other hat on again. Mm -hmm. If we, uh, we overemphasize in a narrative, you write one, uh, a, a specific character, you have to flatten that character out in order to, you know, just narrow them in order to justify doing that. Uh, so they necessarily become limited. And I, I've found that a, a problem myself writing so I, I, I try to avoid doing it so even even where there's a very important character that character has to have a context and a backstory and as soon as you do that you take away what Jung would have called the numinosum the numinous quality of the figure reduces because they have a wider context they have a very numinous quality to them like a god if you reduce it right down and there's very little bandwidth and they that they become the figure from the ground and the, 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 the forward and, and it distracts um, and this is, you, you know, I've gone about figuring ground all the time. And I think it is a distraction and it induces a reduction in consciousness when we do that, when we develop characters who do that kind of thing. So if we do sub personality work, we're generating a fantasy of an abstracted character as if that character represents a personality in their own right. Which would mean, if you follow depth psychology, that that character has a lifeline, a timeline, has their own complexes, maybe has their own shadow, if we're thinking in a Jungian sense, their own anima or animus, you know, um, <coughs> their own personal myth, their own Myers-Briggs type. And, and some people who follow internet gurus treat these internal fictions in that way, as if they are literally little personalities that typically live in their right cerebral hemisphere, like the whole of it without realizing that the right cerebral hemisphere is itself performing different functions not all of them are to do with association as in the association cortex or for the frontal lobe for immediate planning and future planning that kind of thing there are other parts of the, the right cerebral hemisphere to do other things and the right cerebral hemisphere does not work on its own you have to create the problem or the image or the impression that it does in order to abstract anything out um, it takes a trauma of some kind, physical, or you introduce a, med uh, a medical ablation, which is reversible or something like that, in order to, to bring out any meaningful difference between the operation of the hemispheres, because they're meant to work together. They've evolved to work together. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that there is an analogue between overemphasizing the right cerebral hemisphere and everything that we think that should be done or feel should be done with that and then having a figure ground distinction and a fantasy construct these things tend to go together if you observe the kind of people who talk about them whereas it's meant to work as a complete unit a complete whole the brain is and a narrative is meant to work as a complete situation with an, an, an interaction of these characters. And the psyche at a psychological level of analysis, description and explanation is meant to work as a homeostatic function, a whole thing that understands itself, usually. Which is why Jung said, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure about this, by the way, uh, that you don't mess with the unconscious unless you have to. You leave us alone because it will regulate itself. It's meant to. The ego is meant to be confused. The ego is meant to relate to the outside world. The ego takes the risk of being neurotic because it can't meet the demands of the unconscious and its bandwidth is narrow. It's evolved to take all of those risks and to have the benefits of immediate action. That's what it's for. But we can't turn the unconscious into the ego or the ego into the unconscious. It doesn't work because they're meant to operate as one unit. So the more we're reductive and fractionalize, the more neurotic we become. And our narratives will reflect that as well. The myths that we create, the stories we create, the best ones are shared journeys within an entire context that can be understood as instinctive. Therefore, we have implicit knowledge of how it should unfold. That's not archetypal, it's instinctive. Implicit knowledge is instinctive. We know the way it should run and we look to see, is it going to run or is something going to go wrong? That's why we're hooked in. And then the other thing that hooks us in is emotion. Emotion is not archetypal. Emotion is instinctive. Neuropsychoanalysts have demonstrated that.
So uh, we have to be very careful about the ego and its fantasies generating these characters that don't actually exist as abstractions, but it treats them as abstractions. Then it has to make a home in the brain for them and say, your right hemisphere is full of these things. That's really the ego exceeding its proper bounds of operation. The unconscious will just let it do it, so long as it's not disturbed by these distractions. But what will happen is that the ego is not adapting properly to the task of living in an Adlerian sense, socially, out in the world. It's preoccupied with its fantasies and its internal projections. Thank you. Yeah, you've talked before about how, I think you said something like, the best stories are never like a single character's journey no yeah and yeah. i think that if you apply that to the idea of media containing people that makes a lot of sense where if you've got the character if a story has a character decontextualized and it's just the, everything centers around that individual then you could take that individual dominant personality out and then put it like identify with it in your life and then imagine that the rest of the world would then shape around that yeah interjection of it but if the whole, whole narrative is presented in a completely contextualized and integrated way of the interactions between things then it doesn't really make any sense at all on any level to be able to take it out and identify with it so then you can't really it, be really hard to be contained by it when it's set up like that. And so that makes all the sense. And that kind of like click those two yeah. for me. And of course, when you, when you analyze even Marvel, it, there is a context, you know, Superman has got parents, you know, and he starts out with Lana Lang in Smallville, doesn't he? And then he's got Lois Lane in Metropolis. And there's Jimmy Olsen, isn't there? And there's Perry White at the Daily Planet in the original story anyway, as I understand it. So there is a context even for Superman, and there are limitations for him to stop him being a ridiculous character. He is vulnerable. You know, he's vulnerable to kryptonite, and it's different colours, and they have different effects on him. And he's attracted to an Earth woman who is not like him. And you can see there are mythic elements in that. But with Marvel in recent decades, it's just gone like this. And there's all sorts of uh, things going in there that, are elaborations and uh, are political distortions of instinct. And you know, as soon as politics intrudes, in other words, Adlerian pathology intrudes over the top of instinct, you get corruption of instinct. And you can see that now in the way that Marvel's gone woke. It doesn't run anymore, that dog don't hunt anymore. But the original Superman was probably a good idea. Up to a point, I mean, it was very inflated. It was, it was like a classical god. It's beyond the demigods like Achilles or Jason, any of the heroes of classical Greece, he had more than that. He was almost a god. Interesting to see how these, these things uh, work through. But if you engage with the Superman character, then you'd have to engage with his context and feel your way into it. And feeling provides meaning and it, it, it provides a sense of belonging and identity. And so as long as it works through in a classic mythological way, which re always reflects instinct, it's still healthy. But when, but when it goes into really bizarre stuff and, and, and politics, you know, or sh we should know, that our instincts are being corrupted through the propaganda of the way that it's being expressed. And then you get a Jungian inflation very often, which is to try to transcend, it's, tr it's to try to leapfrog what's being caused by that. And you get this now with the demographic of young men who are, you know, we all know who they who they are, whether we call them boyos or not, that it, it's all within that same ecology. They're going for young to try to solve it, probably because their instincts realize there's a logjam here and that their instincts are being corrupted by Adlerianism in a pathological sense. We could call it wokeism as a manifestation. So they, they try and look for the transcendent and the transpersonal and then they walk into internet gurus who are far from uh, the remedy that these young men need. It's oftentimes just the neurotic inverse of wokeism. Yeah. Gurus, which doesn't really help. Gotta get beneath it. 
it's been interesting for us because uh, creatively because we kind of started pushing this back in 2007 and first of all we had to create uh, connections to people who would take us seriously and that was one part of the journey but recently up until uh, covid it was increasingly becoming wokeism by another name which would be the problem because although we're not um opposite to wokeism by choice we are opposite to it by default because we're not trying to push you know masculine stereotypes or anything. we're trying to push instincts as they normally unfold that's a huge challenge to wokeism because it's not so easy a target and therefore is threatening at the same time but it's interesting that people are beginning to listen or actually they're, they're contacting us they've reached out to us we 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 set that aside and they're reaching out to us that suggests that there's a sense that it's going to hit the point of absurdity soon where it can't reduce any further and it'll have to change Jung's enantiodromia which I believe he got from Heraclitus the Greek philosopher the idea of things turning into their opposite so who knows who knows how it will go we'll see um I think it's we, a challenge to everything sorry like that you said the like showing instincts as they naturally unfold is a challenge to wokeism and it i is. think it's a challenge to yeah. almost everything naturally it, it, it is and of course that that people are told that if you act on instinct you become primitive and you become like an animal well mm -hmm. you do if you're an animal if you're a human though you're gifted with other things which is the, the genomic capacity and intentionality to test instinct against the outside world. That's Freud's reality principle. And you can argue there's an instinct to do that because when people feel it in an uncontaminated way, they react from emotion to say, I don't want to degrade into flatline instinct without any reflexivity. I feel the repulsion to do that. That feeling is telling you there's an instinct that is self-regulating you to say you complete your program what you have that is also an instinct but they will say that oh you're going to turn into toxic masculinity the absolute abstraction of that and it'll run riot and you know all the rest of it or women will be forced to be the way they were in the stone age that kind of thing that isn't the intention the intention is to get people to literally evolve a sense of consciousness and fulfillment and adaptation in connection with their instincts as modern humans in this context and if we, we use uh, mythic scenarios or historical ones to illustrate that journey that's to make the journey interesting but also to separate it from wokeism as it is now i mean we, we, we do have some projects that are set in today um but the acceleration of wokeism over recent years means that you, they, they start to look like they're historical, even though they're only five or six years old. That's the pace of wokeism as, it, as it's going. It's accelerating towards its own catabolism. Interesting to observe. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Foster. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Okay, should we go with Ashton, then Dean? Yeah, sure. Hi, Ashton. How's it going? Um, so I got... I got two questions. I have one that's relevant to uh, the fantasy topic and then one relative to something that you addressed during the last seminar. So I'll start with the, the first one. Um, would it not be a natural progression of fantasy as seen in, let's say, children? Because it seems to me that the attachment onto figures from cartoons, books, uh, or even like stories told around a campfire become projected onto no, it, it creates a framework to how they understand the world around them and then it is applied physically. Would that be the natural progression of that fantasy? Yes, it is. And that's absolutely fine where there is no pathology overlaid on that. Uh, and bearing in mind that this is about that, this is about clinical presentation. We then have to look at how that natural process manifests in a clinical presentation. So there's no suggestion that there's anything wrong with fantasy at all. It is normal and it's the right way for the mind uh, and for an individual person to develop just that when people who are normal and are right and are developing well get distracted away from that because of pressures from other people in adaptation then you have a pathological 
uh, situation that will invariably be reflected in their fantasy. Uh, and that can be later in life as well, um, when a culture gets sick. How do you know a culture gets sick? That's a value judgment. And I think really that has to be, has to be down to that, whether we consider a, a particular culture to be uh, sick or not. Um, psychology as a, a psychotherapy as a profession is not immune to politics at all. I, I think I may have mentioned it before that, that Carl Jung in the 1930s himself fell under the sway of a particular political zeitgeist. And he said some very, very unpleasant things about Jews. Uh, and uh, he uh, said some very, very positive things would come out of National Socialism. He said that. He said it. It's a matter of history. He said it more than once. He held that position for a number of years. He saw better. Uh, and he began to publish things just about in time that separated himself from that. Uh, after the war, he was confronted by a number of Jews who'd been in concentration camps and other people. And he was able to satisfy them that he'd simply, in his own words, slipped up. But there are, there are many Jewish young Jungians analysts who still go for Jung on that. They haven't forgotten it, uh, legitimately or otherwise, because he had a life and he unfolded across his lifespan. But the point I'm making here is that it's happening now. There is a political zeitgeist and a large number of Jungians are adapting to this present wokest zeitgeist uh, and I think it's disgusting. And I said so to one of them, who was a professor. Okay. I said to him, um, he's very well known, he's, he, he's world famous. I said, I won't say his name. I said to him, a, a political psychotherapist is a disgusting thing, in my personal opinion. Uh, and he's proudly an activist, a political activist, way over to the far left. But he enjoys a, a lifestyle which you would not associate with the traditional far left for example so but there's a lot of youngians who are doing that now they're, they're, they're adopting all of the politically correct uh, speak they're employing wokest tactics they're cancelling people who don't believe or, or, or view things that way in my mind no difference from what from when young went wrong they're doing the same thing they criticize young too but they don't look at themselves so where's the baseline then of the common humanity that can separate itself from transient political ideologies and, and look for what is the truth in human nature. How many of them are doing that? Not a lot. That's an observation. I think you can confirm it or you can deny it by your own observation and research in the world. But yeah, uh, fantasy is important. It's normal. It should be nurtured and respected. But when somebody goes wrong, you can see the solution in their fantasies very often. Sometimes you can also see what contains them. 